For millenniums, man has uh, seen that he is quite different and quite unique from animals. All of us in this room certainly have seen that too. How is that? Well, we can think, we create, and we analyze, we memorize. It's a unique and interesting thing. I enjoy watching some of the animals around my house. Um, <laughs> I use my office and uh, pray there and look out the window into the backyard. I see little rabbits coming in there hopping to get their morning salad. And then I see the uh, squirrels up in the uh, uh, areca uh, palms. And some of the birds that have nested, they're coming down, their young ones have hopped down on the uh, ground and getting around. And it's fun to look at them and see them. But they can't do what you and I can do. And they certainly cannot think. They cannot, uh, uh, we, we can appreciate. We have the mental capacity to appreciate the creation we look at. And to uh, marvel at the mind behind it. I was uh, <clears throat> reading quickly in the paper this morning and an individual was uh, writing in a column how that he, uh, it was a wonderful day of joy because the owner of the formerly Washington Redskins, now Washington Commanders, was stepping down selling the team to another uh, buyer or group or whatever. And this, he was talking about this and he said, even though I uh, don't believe in God, I have to believe, uh, praise God for the fact that this has finally happened. You know? <laughs> And then you're sitting there thinking, uh, where'd you get the intelligence to write the article? You stop and look. Herbert Armstrong used to say that um, uh, <clears throat> any thinking man knows that there is a God. And uh, <clears throat> yes, I, he said that more than once, and that is very, very true. You cannot explain everything of the creation by just randomness and uh, all of that. Well, I'm not here to talk about creation versus evolution or something today, but I do want to talk about the incredible mind that you and I have. It is something that uh, is really uh, incredible to behold. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to look at the subject here today. Do we have an immortal soul? Or is there a special spirit in man that you do not find in any animal? Well, I think all of us already know the answer to the question, but how well can we explain it to others? I heard a minister at the Feast of Tabernacles a number of years ago make the statement that if you can't explain it, then you do not really understand it yet. And I thought, I've always kept that in the back of my mind. I thought, well, you know, that's made a lot of sense to me. And I think a lot of times we take for granted, we know what we believe, but can we really explain it? Uh, <clears throat> or would we have trouble? A lot of times I've recalled in the past, not so much in recent years, but it's been quite some time ago, where members would be questioned at work or somewhere, and uh, they would refer, well, you need to talk to my pastor because and the reason why is they could not explain uh, what it is that they believed when they were being questioned by somebody who did not believe it. So I, I think many of these things on when it comes to our basic teachings and doctrines, we should look and ask to ourselves, how well can we explain it? Uh, let me just digress a little more. This should have been something that many ministers back in 1991 through 95, 96 should have been able to do, as well as many members when it came to a lot of our teachings and doctrines, doctrines of God in the Bible. And a lot of people thought they understood the, those things, but obviously since so many departed, uh, they didn't. They could not explain it. And that's why a lot of times I like to go back on basics and look at them uh, so that we understand and uh, hopefully we can always, as the scripture says, give an answer for the, for the hope that lies within. Explain it and be able to uh, show uh, from the uh, Bible what the Bible says. All right, let's begin with the question, what is man? 
The Bible is the only place to go uh, to look for and find an answer above the human level of reasoning. So let's go to Genesis, starting in the beginning here, and look at uh, Genesis 2, where God, of course, created Adam and Eve. And uh, <clears throat> here in verse um, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Now, this is the New King James Version. Uh, it says there in the uh, King James, a uh, what? Uh, became a living soul. And we used to write and uh, point out using the King James Bible that we don't have a soul. We are a soul. I believe that is not correct either. Uh, if one looks at the, uh, the reason I want to mention that to start with is because if you go to a concordance, like Strong's and Exhaustion of Concordance, and you um, look up the word soul, uh, that word appears in the Bible, King James, New King James Bible, and all English translations, and now it appears quite a bit in the Jewish translation into English. The, um, oh, I forgot the, the name, it's, uh, uh, it should come automatic, but it didn't. But anyhow, it is also used there. Is the English word S-O-U-L a definition for the Hebrew word nephesh or the Greek word, the counterpart to nephesh, which is in the Greek language, suke? Is that truly a definition of those two words, both the Greek, or excuse me, the Hebrew and the Greek? Well, the answer is no, it isn't. Uh, from the New World Encyclopedia, the modern English word soul derives from the old English soul, I guess, I'm probably not pronouncing it, S-A-W-O-L, or S-A-W-E-L, which itself comes from the old high German sula, S-E-U-L-A, or S-E-L-A. The Germanic word is a translation of the Greek suke and uh, was used beginning in, uh, in the fourth century. Um, interesting, just to find out. It is not, when we look at what is the definition of the Hebrew word, uh, which is nephesh, and the Greek word, its counterpart is suke, it means a living being, animal life. And as we've turned many times here in chapter 1, God created the animals. Uh, the same word is used there. They became uh, uh, <coughs> living creatures. Correct translation. Living creatures. Same Hebrew word, which in chapter 2, verse 7, in the King James Version, at least, was translated as a soul. No, we are not a soul. We do not have a soul. We'll see as we go along later, we do have a spirit, though, and it is different than what is commonly uh, taught. So man became a living being, not a living soul. And uh, <clears throat> from this uh, in chapter 2 of Genesis and in verse 7. Now, this is still <clears throat> the teaching both in the Catholic Church and most Protestant churches as well that you have a soul. Now, if you want to uh, uh, hear that verified, go to a uh, Protestant or Catholic funeral. And I've at times had to share in those funerals uh, because the deceased was a member of, of the church, but the mate or the spouse was not and belonged to another church. And one, one was Baptist and the other was Methodist. I remember that very well. And uh, <clears throat> they wanted their minister also to speak on behalf of their deceased spouse. And they didn't like the, the, the Church of God and uh, what we believed and taught. Of course, we were going to teach the, uh, the resurrection. No, as the one minister, I got to speak last on both occasions, which I, <laughs> I, I'm glad that happened, uh, <clears throat> because the... The one minister, the uh, Methodist, well, uh, now I know 
whatever, I forgot his first name, is up there looking down right now at us. And, uh, you know, well, how could that be? Because they were teaching he has an immortal soul. He's up there in heaven looking down here at us right now. And, uh, <laughs> oh, well, I had then a, a Baptist minister. And this, uh, the lady was, uh, who was deceased was a, a church member. And uh, he was not focusing so much about her as he was on her family there in the front row that had ceased coming to church, to his church. They weren't going to any church. And <laughs> he was talking about, he, he was putting everybody down this way <laughs> and uh, uh, going in the other direction. And of course, you know, if a person has uh, lived a bad life, well, they're immortal souls down there in hell and it's burning. Uh, the Catholics, of course, you had Dante's Infernal. Uh, Dante, uh, what's his last uh, name? Miguel, and I can't remember how to pronounce it. But you had those degrees of hell down there, and of course, uh, you needed a certain amount of time. You needed, uh, if you're Catholic, and uh, in order to roast uh, all the evil out, you, uh, you get the leaven out, right? And uh, bring you up, uh, hopefully, sometime where you might have opportunity for the beatific uh, vision, is it, or, or heaven. Well, let's go back here now uh, to um, uh, these scriptures and take a look here at it. Uh, <clears throat> a few others. Uh, there is something I need to explain to you about the Hebrew word here, uh, uh, nephesh. Uh, the Hebrew system of thought uh, does not include the opposition of the terms body and soul, or body and life, which are really Greek and Latin in origin. Let me explain a little bit what that means. Body being just the, the flesh, whatever body it is, and the life that's in it uh, are all contained in the single word, nephesh. That's not the case when you go to the Greek in the New Testament, which is important to know if you're looking at this subject. It takes two words to explain that in the Greek. The Greek word, so I'm getting ahead of myself, I know, on this part. Soma means body. And suke means living being or life. So it takes two words to say what Nephesh says in one word. It includes both the body and the life in the body. Or if the person's dead, the, the life that's no longer in the body. And uh, <clears throat> you might recall, since I've said something about that, and you'll find it in the New Testament, Paul always used as <clears throat> the figure of speech uh, the word uh, soma for body. The body of Christ is what? The church. The body. And uh, so he would use that word in a um, uh, figurative or symbolic way. Okay, let me um, move along here. Uh, <clears throat> the Hebrew word, of course, includes both meanings, the body itself and the life in it. Uh, a couple usages that help defend or define, I should say, the word in the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis 9, verse 4, just a couple pages ahead if your Bible is still open. 9, 4, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, uh, that is, its blood. Uh, you shall not eat uh, eat flesh with its life. The word life is nephesh in the Hebrew. The word, uh, notice it doesn't, uh, it's not soul, it's life. And it, the Hebrew word there is nephesh. Uh, <clears throat> the life is the nephesh and it means the blood. The life is in the blood as we see in Leviticus uh, uh, where it mentions that as well as in Hebrews. Uh, <clears throat> In Isaiah 53, which we read here at Passover, let's take a look. There's something uh, um, <clears throat> I would like to pour, mention. Isaiah 53, and in uh, verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul onto life. Is that what Jesus did? 
No, he, that word is nephesh. He poured out his life unto death. And uh, there is a, a misuse of the word soul. And it really shouldn't be there at all. It's not a definition for the Hebrew word nephesh. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's creeped into the English Bible. And even the Jewish Bible uses the word soul, uh, whereas in the past it did not. Um, I don't need to finish the verse. Uh, well, uh, again, it repeats itself in the middle of, verse, of the verse because he poured out his nephesh, his life, his being unto death, not his soul. Nephesh is not a soul. And uh, <clears throat> that, um, uh, again, just uh, there's a misuse of it in that case. Now, what about, I told you that the Hebrew word means both the life and the body. Whereas in the Greek, you have to have two words for that. Well, let's take a look here at, in the prophet Haggai. Uh, in Haggai chapter um, 2, and uh, third from the end of the uh, Old Testament, Haggai 2 and in verse 13. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body, nephesh, uh, touches any of these, will it be unclean? And it goes on there. The point is, that, uh, the two words there, dead body, comes from the uh, Hebrew, nephesh. So it means both the life, and it can mean the body if it's dead, too, all in one word. Uh, not so, of course, in the Greek. Uh, <clears throat> nowhere in the Old Testament do we see the word soul, for nephesh, to mean something living separately inside our physical bodies. That you have something here that when the body dies, it escapes, it either goes up or goes down, right? And if you're Catholic, it's in between, called purgatory. Uh, no, <laughs> um, there is nothing like that whatsoever in the Old Testament, in the Greek. You don't see that. Uh, in fact, the evidence is that man is quite mortal. Look at Ezekiel chapter, um, chapter what, 18 here. Uh, this is a scripture we used to have in a lot of our literature. I don't know if we do so much anymore, but uh, we do, uh, do refer to it. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 and 20. In verse 4, behold, all souls or lives, it should be, again, it's nephesh, are mine. And the nephesh, or the being, or the life of the Father, as well as the life, or the being of the Son, is mine. And the nephesh, the individual, the, the, the living being who sins, shall die. Repeated, in, repeated here in verse 20 as well. The, uh, again, the word is nephesh, but notice how many times they use the word soul. Uh, the translators, even here in the New King James. It just, uh, like I say, if you look at a concordance and look up the word soul, I mean, just columns and columns of, uh, of scriptures with the word soul in it. And my, I, I, it should not be there because uh, in the Old Testament, nephesh is, that's not a translation for nephesh. Uh, <clears throat> some of the King, New King James does translate nephesh correctly. For example, Genesis 2, verse 7, where we began. In the New King James, that's correct. Living being, not soul, as the authorized King James of 1611 translated it. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to uh, Romans chapter 6. We'll go to the New Testament now. Uh, a couple of these things. Romans chapter 6. And in verse uh, 23. Very familiar scripture, I think, to all of us in the church. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Is death, not life somewhere else, right? We've explained that, I think, in our booklets all over the, uh, uh, through the years. Uh, <clears throat> it does mean, yes, wages of sin is death, and it, uh, not repented of, will be eternal death. And uh, is what is referring to, but the gift of God is eternal life on the, on the other side of the spectrum. 
We see this uh, even more when we see what the Old Testament says about the state of the dead. What is the state of the dead? Have they gone off somewhere else to, to, uh, to live? With? Notice here in Genesis 3 and verse 19. Now, some of these scriptures on the state of the dead you'll never hear in a Protestant or a uh, Catholic funeral. It's kind of interesting when you do, uh, I've been where I've been in the audience listening, and then also where I've uh, been involved in splitting it with uh, some other uh, pastor or whatever. And uh, I also find what's interesting is what they don't say. And uh, we should uh, be aware of some of these things. Let me get to it here. Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 19. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. There's no indication, is there? But your soul will go to either down or up. There's no indication of that whatsoever. When you die, uh, a lot of times people want to believe that the one, especially when it's a very... The, uh, facing the truth about death at a lot of times at a funeral is very difficult and hard. The person is dead until the resurrection. And for the individual, it will be like snapping your fingers or blinking your eye instant from their last conscious to their next conscious in the resurrection. But that's not so for the living who are standing there and uh, listening to the funeral service or whatever and thinking uh, about their loved one. Um, and especially if it's a child. Uh, most uh, probably difficult uh, service to do is with a child that died in an accident or died of a disease that uh, uh, quite premature, obviously, then in, in life. So, <clears throat> but let's get back here now and continue on. Let's go to Psalm 146. Psalm 146. Um, again, this shows the, uh, the uh, state of the, uh, of the dead. You might recall as you're turning there, remember uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus delayed for four days coming, right? John, what is it, 11? And uh, <clears throat> was it Mary who said to him, if only you had come earlier, uh, he would have been, uh, you could have saved him, he would have been raised. Uh, and he makes a statement there, chapter 11, 25, that uh, I am the resurrection. Well, we know, Lord, in the, and we believe in the resurrection. He didn't believe that was going to happen right then. But of course, he, raised, he put everybody out of the room and uh, raised him uh, from the dead. I've always wondered about Lazarus. I never see his name in the book of Acts or anywhere in the New Testament. And Mary and Martha and... Uh, some of these individuals, hopefully, uh, they were very prominent in the Jerusalem church as time went on. Well, anyhow, I finally have gotten to uh, Psalm 146 while I'm talking. And, uh, but here in verse 4, uh, it says, His spirit. Oh, there's a spirit? Well, there certainly is, and we know that. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Now, that's not really the best. Uh, uh, I have to say the authorized King James is better on that last phrase there. Uh, his thoughts perish, not his plans. And uh, <clears throat> that's exactly right. There is no life. There is no life there anymore. Well, we all know that. A lot of times at most funerals, they have an open casket, either at viewing time or even uh, before the funeral begins, that type of thing. There's no life. Life is gone. We all know that. And yet a lot of times people are kidding themselves. He, she, whoever, they're up there. And we want to believe they're, they're really not dead. And many times people will be talking about, well, they're better off now. They're in a better life today. No, they're not. 
not until Christ returns, if they're in the first resurrection or at the end in God's plan. They don't know a thing. Only the living do. And one of the things that we really have to come to to recognize is God's plan, he is thinking forever. Forever. Now this may seem, uh, because it's, it's absolute, there's, uh, you're not going to see the individual again in this present life. But God who cannot lie says you will in the resurrection and that, <clears throat> and, uh, that we will live together and be uh, in the body of Christ in the family of God. And uh, unless we have uh, somehow disqualified ourselves uh, by our, our actions. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and uh, <clears throat> verse uh, 19 and 20 here. Verse 19 of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 4. What happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity, Solomon writes. Um, I disagree with him on that last statement. Uh, all go to one place, and all are from the dust and all return to dust. I, that's, we're de that came straight out of Genesis, right? Now I'll turn a couple pages over here to um, chapter um, 9 and in verse 5. And I will use this one a lot of times in funerals, especially when I know there's a mixed audience. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't heard other ministers ever use this statement. Uh, certainly the minister did my mother's funeral, uh, never used it, and uh, uh, as we were listening, my wife and I were. But anyhow, uh, again, it shows that uh, we don't have a soul that goes somewhere else to live. Uh, <clears throat> where did the popular concept of a soul in man originate? Well, you can go, some have pointed out, and I can, I can agree with it, all the way back to Adam and Eve. You know, uh, Satan said, uh, uh, <clears throat> the Lord said, You'll, no, you won't die. And, well, they eventually did. And uh, as though she had a soul or something in her. Then you can come up to the Egyptians uh, and their uh, uh, Book of the Dead and uh, their souls and everything. They uh, mummified and put all kinds of stuff in the uh, tomb so that they could make the journey. Their soul would make the journey to wherever. Uh, the Indians, I believe, and of India, I forgot what they, I'd have to look that up. There's a word, uh, what they call it, and I, I'm sorry, I just don't remember fully to explain it. Uh, <clears throat> then you come to the Greeks. You can go back to the time of Plato in his book, The Republic, uh, explaining to King Pericles of Athens uh, how that you can control the people. You tell them that uh, you're a god and uh, that they have a soul. And if they're not in submission to you as the god king, then their soul is going to be destroyed and, and uh, burn in fire. Um, later on, you find uh, when uh, the Catholic uh, author Dante had his steps down into hell um, and all of that, that's basically how the uh, Catholic Church has uh, uh, taught hell, is from uh, that man's imagination. Let me go on here a little bit more. <clears throat> now let's go to uh, more into the New Testament. Um, we might ask, well, doesn't it speak of an immortal soul? In fact, uh, this is where uh, many of your modern uh, teachings of that uh, will turn to some of the scriptures here in the New Testament. I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. And 
Let's take a look here at verses 28. Jesus said, And do not fear those who kill the soma, the body, but cannot kill the life, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soma, the body, or the, excuse me, both the life, as, as a suke is a word there for soul, and the body, soma, in Gehenna fire, in Gehenna, which would be eternal death. Uh, <clears throat> why are two words there used? Well, because it was required in the Greek language and how they, uh, their system of thought, it, you, they would, if this was in Hebrew, you'd just use the one word. Uh, <clears throat> what is um, he talking about here? Uh, that uh, the soul can go down into hell? No. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill uh, the life. Eternal life is what it would, is referring to here. Cannot destroy your eternal life that you have in Christ and in God. Uh, the, um, again, the body is the soma, and uh, the soul is the Greek word suke. There is no immortal soul here in this. Uh, animals in the New Testament and man are both suke. For example, let's look at Revelation chapter 8 and verse 9. Revelation 8 and in verse 9. And a third of the living creatures, the Greek word is suke, the counterpart to the Hebrew word nephesh. A third of the living creatures, or the suke, in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed, as it goes on to say. Here, the same word used for man is used for animals, as we see there in Revelation. All right, now let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I actually use this scripture we're turning to when I speak about the Trinity. <laughs> you may, what's, what's this? Well, y'all, let me explain as, you, as we turn here. And I will speak here between now and, uh, and uh, Pentecost. I plan to anyhow. In uh, First uh, <clears throat> uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify or set you apart completely and may your, uh, let's see, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a scripture that is used to uh, also try to uh, show in the New Testament you do have a soul. Look at that again. This is... Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, this is a spirit, you have a spirit. The word soul there is a living creature, and of course body is soma. This is called a triad. That is, it is a group of three. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned that I bring this out and I use it when I'm talking about the Trinity because there is one Trinitarian scripture in the Bible, which is 1 John 5, verse 7, and these three are one. The only problem is uh, John never wrote it. It was inserted into a copy later on about, I've heard from the fourth century to the eighth century when it was inserted because the uh, doctrine of the Trinity was being established during those uh, centuries of time. It is important to understand the difference between a triune and a tri triad. This is a triad, a group of three. Another one, when we baptize, we baptize using a triad. Name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now to be a triune, three and one, it would have to say, and these three are one. It does not. There is no tri trinity in the Bible, Old or New Testament, either way. I just mention that as a side to this scripture because here we have a triad, spirit, uh, soul, which should uh, be life, body, which comes from the Greek word soma. 
Uh, <clears throat> it is not talking about an immortal soul. Let me read it again and explain it. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify or set apart you completely, and may your whole spirit, as we're going to see, it's the spirit in man. A, why would I say that? As opposed to the Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit would be with a capital S. And uh, the small s on spirit is referring to the spirit in man in the New Testament. Correctly so. A whole spirit, uh, soul, or being, or life. The word soul really shouldn't be there. It's suke in the Greek. Uh, soul is not a translation for suke. Uh, <clears throat> it's a living being, living creature. I just read in Revelation 8, verse 9, animals are living Souls? No, it's living creatures, living beings. And that, that's quite a difference. But this word soul appears so much in the both testaments in English uh, Bibles that uh, it's like you, you get it in, it's uh, subconsciously working on people's minds who read the Bible. And uh, thinking, well, yeah, man, man, you know, I guess I do believe that. Well, no, we don't. We want to believe, you know, we are to prove all things and hold fast to that which is true. Okay, <clears throat> this is one of the scriptures that uh, should not be considered. Let me see here, my time. I'm, okay, I've got a little time left. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on to another example. Uh, some of you might be familiar, you've probably heard about it a little bit. How about Lazarus and the rich man? Good example of dying and the souls going one to heaven and one is on across the, the uh, uh, I don't know, uh, chasm and in hell. One's in hell, one's up there uh, in, uh, 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 supposedly in heaven, Abraham's bosom. Well, that should show it, right? And that's one of the scriptures to prove you have an immortal soul and that's one that uh, those people that believe in that are going to turn to. Let's take a look at this. Luke chapter um, 16. And uh, <clears throat> is that true? Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid uh, at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Does this sound like a true story, by the way? Jesus is, is relating a true story. Is that it? Now, he did heal a man. He resurrected a man named Lazarus. No, it's not the same one. And it's not a true story. It's a parable. It's a parable. Do you establish a doctrine on a parable? No. I might su give support to it, but that's not what you, you turn to for your, your proof. All right, let me pick up again here and go on. Verse 22, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Well, see, the angels took the beggar's uh, uh, soul and carried it to Abraham's bosom, assuming that Abraham's in heaven. Is he? Uh, come back, keep that thought in mind. And being uh, uh, in torment, the, okay, the, uh, the rich man has died, he's buried, and being in torment in Hades, grave in Greek, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off. His soul did, because after all, he's died, right? So what's, what, what's looking at Abraham? The soul. Is it? Uh, <clears throat> again, to come back, <laughs> what verse one? Uh, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. When he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip uh, the tip of his finger in water 
and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, wouldn't you want a little more water than just that? I, what kind of uh, anguish is this man in? Physical anguish? In this parable, he's in mental anguish. He's really stressed out when he recognizes uh, what he is uh, about to enter. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass uh, <clears throat> to us. It's impossible. Well, because uh, in this uh, parable, Lazarus is no longer a physical being. But in the resurrection here that this man has come into, which would be the, the, third de the uh, second death, the third resurrection, uh, he is physical, that is, the rich man is. Maybe a couple things here to uh, get to it quickly. Was Abraham in heaven? As some would say, but we'll see right here, uh, the rich man's in his bosom up there, and uh, there's a gulf between him and the rich, uh, the rich man. Lazarus is, is, is with Abraham. Well, let's uh, hold your place here. Uh, let's go over here to John chapter 8. <laughs> Now, it's interesting how that uh, Jesus, of course, brought up Abraham in this parable because the Jewish people, he was the father of the, of the nation and uh, highly respected. Well, here in John uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 52 and 53, it says, Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead not up in heaven, but he is dead, uh, <clears throat> and the prophets. And you say that if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Which gives a clue right there as to why he, this uh, parable back in Luke is centered around Abraham, who is dead, and, you pro and the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Now, going on down to verse 58, where he said, before Abraham was, I am. A name and title uh, for uh, God and for the Lord of the, uh, in the Old Testament. They recognized that right away, and they were going to take up the stones. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, come back here to Luke uh, chapter um, 16, and I want to pick it up here in verse uh, 23 and 4. And being tormented in Hades, he left, lifted up the, his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And when he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that, I, that he may dip the, uh, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame." Notice that Jesus did not say when that was going to happen. People will assume it's happening right now, or it happened back there 2,000 years ago uh, when the rich man died, when both of them actually died. But we find, if we go to Revelation 20, and to save a little time, I won't, I think most of you, are, well, maybe I will. Revelation 20, we have three resurrections, don't we? No, no, nobody's up there now until uh, 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 Jesus Christ returns, which is, will be the first one. Revelation uh, 20. And uh, <clears throat> from the parable, it's very clear when Lazarus will, um, uh, would be in, in this um, analogy. In chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. And certainly that happened in the Middle Ages and times before that and after, too. 
who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their heads, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They lived. That's when they lived, when they were resurrected. But the rest of the dead did not live again a second time until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That is the one at the end of verse 4. The second resurrection is what's being talked about in verse 5. It also is repeated, of course, as we see at the feast every year. Verse 11 and 12, great white throne judgment. Uh, <clears throat> Blessed and holy, verse 6, is he who has part in the first resurrection, which in according to the uh, parable <clears throat> would be Lazarus. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And of course, uh, Lazarus, in the parable, you would uh, drop down to verse 13 through 15. Uh, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Verse 14, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. That's the fire from the parable that uh, Lazarus would see. He wasn't seeing it in the day he died. He will see it in the resurrection just prior to the event being carried out. This is the second death. And obviously his name was not written in the book of life in the parable, which is why and anyone whose name is not in that book of life will be in that third resurrection, which is the lake of fire. Burn forever and ever, which is taught, right? Because that's another thing. By using the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, they're down there burning forever and ever. And I have seen some people, like uh, they're just gloating over the fact that a, a person they consider to be so evil that it's uh, good that they're down there just burning but never consumed and just being tortured forever in flames of fire. Well, that's Dante's Inferno as well. Uh, <clears throat> no. It will burn the earth and those who are not in the book of life, and that will be it. Eternal death. And uh, <clears throat> no suffering after that. It will be, uh, there will be a punishment that uh, it, it's eternal in the sense that, uh, I mean, the fire is not going to go forever, and the individual is not going to be in a flame for the rest of eternity. All right, let me move along. Uh, <clears throat> there is one other one here, and I'm going to um, just quickly refer to it, Revelation chapter 6, that is used many times, the souls under the altars. Now, hey, wait a minute, have we overlooked something here? Maybe, maybe it is in the New Testament, right? <clears throat> that the, it's talking about the saints, their souls being under the altar. Uh, it's uh, really referring to a time of uh, the fifth seal or the great tribulation here. Revelation um, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. The fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal and I saw under the altar the souls, the lives, it should be, of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony uh, which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who uh, would be killed as they were uh, was completed. So if you were one of those and... Uh, you were uh, killed in 1000 A.D., being, uh, burned at the stake, in fact, because uh, you would not uh, <clears throat> uh, change your religious beliefs at that time. You need to wait a little bit longer because Christ hasn't returned. So rest under the altar. That's quite a reward, isn't it? That's a lot of sleep. And uh, <clears throat> to uh, know... Many things in the book of Revelation 
are <clears throat> written in symbolic form to tell us something. Now these individuals, when they, uh, <clears throat> they're gonna come up in the apparent, the ones being referred to in the first resurrection when Christ returns. I am the resurrection, John 11, 25. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, do not have a soul in any way that is resting under an altar uh, up in heaven. But it is symbolic of the fact that, yes, God does avenge. In fact, when, when he avenges that city in Revelation chapter 18, and about verse 20, what does he say to my apostles that rejoice over this? Because I, I, I probably should get, uh, just turn to it real quickly. In 18 and about, I think it's verse 20, Da, 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 da. Let me see. Yes. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you, holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. That also is applying to uh, Revelation 6, verse 9 through 11. Quote the souls, the lives under the altar. They're not living under the altar in heaven. Uh, and have to be, now I'm staking you under the, the, the altar here for the next 2,000 years until the plan is finished and Christ returns and then uh, <clears throat> I'll let you out. No, when we are changed from flesh to spirit, uh, we have great freedom of movement <clears throat> and uh, we're not going to be uh, uh, in one position under uh, a... Um, under an altar, like a table, uh, in heaven. All right, I've talked a little bit trying to show you here, there is no immortal soul. And the scriptures that are used, parables are not used as a uh, source of teaching doctrine. Uh, <clears throat> and when we look to see what it, the, it symbolizes, uh, recognize, like there with Lazarus and the rich man, well, Abraham, he's dead. Abraham has been dead for about 3,800 years. And when Christ returns and he rises to meet him in the air, it will be instant to him from his last conscious moment. And that's how God takes care of it. He's not off living up somewhere else that is a soul. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you look at that subject... It did not originate in the Bible. It has been inserted into the Bible, but it did not originate in the Bible at all. Now, I began by mentioning, when you look at man and what is he? He has the ability to think, to create, to do incredible things that animals, which we love to watch, well, I think most all people like to watch a lot of those uh, uh, Nat Geo adventures or various things uh, showing the animals out in the wild of Africa or wherever they might be. And I enjoy watching them running around in my yard too. Uh, just gentle creatures. But they don't have a mind to think. They're constantly on guard looking uh, for some predator that would be after them. Uh, <clears throat> what a life to live, right? <laughs> Um, but they, they don't have a mind to think or to appreciate one way or the other. Now let's take a look and see what we do have that God made us totally different than any animal and we were created. And we know that. Let's go to start in the book of Job. This is the most ancient book in the uh, Bible. Uh, it is older than uh, the uh, first five books as far as we understand it. And this may have been written uh, by, uh, by Moses, uh, possibly in the time he was in the wilderness, uh, not in the wilderness, well, he was before he came back to, uh, before he saw the burning bush, somewhere in that range. It's uh, quite a story. We're not exactly sure where some of the locations are. But let's take a look here in um, Job chapter 32. Uh, this is an interesting book to speak on. It's a long book. 
And a lot of times people wondered, well, what was the problem that God was trying to, uh, cre uh, to reveal here? I think there's more than one problem, but anyhow, uh, here in Job chapter 32, Eli, who uh, contradicts Job's friends, and <clears throat> in verse 8, we uh, have this. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. There is a spirit in man. When does that spirit enter? Um, we thought at the breath of life, but later we come to think and believe <clears throat> at conception. Now that's why the abortion, and I think a lot of other churches and people believe the same way who are pro-life, that uh, <clears throat> how can you so, uh, without any conscience, take away and kill the unborn. That, that, end, that uh, creature, that creature, that individual, that child, boy or girl, developing in the womb of a woman is a living being that has the potential to become a son of God. And uh, how can you um, just say, uh, well, no, it's just a, uh, What's the term that was used? If, if, if you do it early enough, then that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> as soon as you find out you're pregnant, well, quickly get the, this little thing, which is just hardly developed yet, um, and that'll be all right. You don't want to let it go too far. Well, life is precious. I've wondered about that. Maybe I can digress a moment here. There are other nations that practice abortion. The Chinese, for example, only allow one child. And so that means <clears throat> hundreds and millions are aborted as though, well, what would you compare it to? Like stepping on an anthill and killing all the ants or something. Life is very precious. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I wonder whether God, if the spirit of man has, when a, the egg and the sperm are joined together, does the spirit in man transfer, come in at that time from the uh, mother and the father? That thing develops. Now, there are times when uh, there will be problems that will not develop correctly. We know that. But, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it uh, certainly needs all the tender loving care once it is born, doesn't it? Not like some animals that can Im immediately get up and follow the herd uh, to keep up with the herd so they don't uh, get left behind. But everything created in uh, a way that is, uh, 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 it's beautiful to observe and to see. But uh, <clears throat> when does the spirit of man come in to a, to a human being? We have the last we have thought because another reason why was that during the time that a child is developing in the womb, it can learn certain things. One of the things that uh, a number of years ago, it's been quite some time ago, there was a book, and I don't remember the title of the book, the story, and it was Mr. Armstrong uh, was told about it and uh, was quite intrigued by it. That <clears throat> it's a story about a child that at age four, could play this incredible music on the piano. And what they found out was that while this child was in the womb of its mother, the mother was playing that very music. And during the time of her pregnancy, she like, I guess, to kind of relax, uh, whatever it was, uh, she liked to play that music. That child, without even going and taking lessons on the piano, could sit down and play it. Showing that, of course, that the child was able to learn in the womb certain things, being passed on, I'm sorry, being passed on. Uh, <clears throat> how could that be if the spirit of man had not already entered that developing child? Well, anyhow, let's move along. There is a spirit in man. Let's find out a little bit more about it. Uh, let's go back to Genesis 2 now real quickly. One thing I did not mention there, 
Genesis chapter 2, and in verse uh, 7 again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, the breath, the ruach in Hebrew, R-U-A-C-H, the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, word, uh, ruach, means wind, breath, and also spirit, also spirit. Uh, <clears throat> Let's take now with that in mind, and we'll go to Job and one more. I'm going to get through this here very quickly. We're not too far from finishing. But let's go to Job 27 again. Job 27. And verse 3. As long as my breath, the Hebrew word is ruach, is in me. And the breath of God in my nostrils. Then he goes on to say, My lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. As long as I have that in me. Because why? I can determine and make the decision between right and wrong. Between what God says not to do or what to do. As we all can. Uh, <clears throat> I've already read Psalm 146, verse 4, that uh, his breath leaves him and his thoughts are no more. His breath is, the breath is the ruach or the spirit. It can be either way translated and be correct. This spirit gives man intellect, ability to create, to invent, to develop, to remember and learn. Now, all of you there, most of you have your cell phones. Uh, please keep them all free. No. <laughs> I've mentioned this. I'm looking down here at Larry's cell phone sitting there. You're ready to go. What an amazing thing. The reason I'm pointing it out. Can you? I, I could. I don't understand how you. Uh, obviously, there are enough people who have enough education that they can understand a cell phone and how to make something like that. I don't understand a computer chip. Uh, <clears throat> do any of the animals you have around the house, cat, dogs, anything, do they understand that? I don't even understand that. But obviously people with enough education into that technology, they do. How can you put all that information into such a tiny little thing? It's an incredible thing. Well, only those with the spirit in man, as the Bible uses that term, can do that. No animal can ever do anything like that. What an incredible thing. And God, uh, you know, when man was building uh, the Tower of Babel, let's go down and mix up their languages because there's nothing that they cannot do if we leave them together united in the same language. Now we're coming to the end of the age and look at some of the things that man has. And of course, the trouble is that they may be used in a destructive way that could destroy us all if God did not intervene. Uh, <clears throat> in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and in uh, <clears throat> verse 7, now, this is a scripture I do use in um, uh, funerals. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Yes, the individual who's deceased, that usually is in the casket in front of you when you're talking, that spirit, and if they indeed have God's Holy Spirit, both have returned to God who gave it. And uh, that is a perfect, uh, what, uh, uh, everything is in that spirit to tell God how to recreate that person in the resurrection. That person that will be the very same. Everything is recorded. Everything is there. 
and uh, <clears throat> far more than any kind of recording that man has learned how to fix or to make. Um, <clears throat> in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, just going back in verse 21, in 321, did I read this earlier? I'll read it again. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes to the earth? Well, what goes upward? Is it an immortal soul, or is it a spirit that contains everything in man that returns to God who gave it? God isn't down. He is up. That's why I would say that here. It doesn't mean that you have an immortal soul in this sense. We'll see by looking at a couple other scriptures. Let's go to Ezekiel 37, the dry bones. Now you hear this at, on the last great day of the feast. This will be brought up because it's talking about a resurrection. And, uh, <clears throat> but look again at what's said about that resurrection. In Ezekiel 37, verses 7 through 10, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinew, the flesh, came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath, there was no ruach in them yet, no spirit in them. Remember, ruach can be translated wind, spirit, breath, all correct. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, to the ruach, to the spirit. Prophesy, son of man, <clears throat> and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. And uh, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived. You know, there was a perfect physical creation, or uh, resurrection and creation. But something was missing. Life. The breath had to come for these bodies that are all formed, bone to bone, sinew to sinew, flesh to flesh. It had to have the breath, the spirit, the wind, as the word uh, can be translated, in order for them now to live. Um, <clears throat> and so they did. You know, there's a couple things interesting uh, to me, anyhow. In verse 6, I will put sinew on you, bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. How are they going to know that? Are they going to remember how they died? Look at verse 13. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I've put the Ruach back into you. You are as you were before. I thought about that at times. They remember how they died in battle? How they died of sickness? Uh, what happened to them? It makes you wonder, you know. You're going to know that I am the Lord. You're going to know that you were dead and now you're alive. I've brought you back to life. What else are you going to remember? Uh, <clears throat> interest, some, at least something there to think about. I'm putting the breath of life back into you. A couple more and we'll finish up here. Let's go to uh, Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12. And um, <clears throat> Zechariah also mentions it. And 12 verse, uh, Zechariah 12, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. That's really a think about that. I enjoy looking at astronomy. And uh, <clears throat> I, in fact, I have a book from the Smithsonian. We display book and everything going through the latest of the pictures by <clears throat> what was the telescope sent back and by uh, the uh, it's gone so far now that it's uh, I forgot the name of the uh, probe they sent into space going by all the planets in our solar system and sending back pictures 
of <clears throat> Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto. And uh, I look there, here's a full eight and a half uh, <clears throat> by 11 page color picture of the planet Pluto. There's nothing on it. <laughs> this is just a big rock. Uh, <clears throat> but an amazing thing that man can show all of that. And then it shows how all the different galaxies in our universe. And there is order that you and I just do not fully comprehend, I believe, and understand. When God created all of it through Jesus Christ, uh, you have uh, ga uh, yeah, galaxies forming. There's hundreds, one, hundreds and millions of galaxies out there. It's endless. Planets, uh, moons form around, and they usually all like uh, our Earth and our moon are going around a star. It's just incredible the things that uh, are out there that were made. And uh, <clears throat> the ancients used to gaze up and look at them. Isaiah talked about the circle of the Earth. He understood very clearly this was the Earth was round. And they looked up there and talked about the various uh, <clears throat> formations of the stars and gave it names and all of that. You have some of that here in the book of Psalms. <clears throat> but it shows how incredible God is to create something like this. It's not just, and uh, there is order in all the creation, whether it's on the earth or in the heavens. Uh, final scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul speaks of this and distinguishes it between the two spirits. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And in verse uh, <clears throat> 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? And even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. There is a different spirit that, as we saw at the Passover, <coughs> excuse me, in John, that uh, it is a spirit of truth. Uh, Paul said, and Christ said too, that it leads us into truth. But there is also a spirit, a natural spirit, I guess the best way I could call it a, to distinguish that from the Holy Spirit, that gives us the abilities to do the things that, uh, <clears throat> that are unique that only human beings can do. Well, brethren, <clears throat> this is, uh, to me, when I get into something, I enjoy this type of a subject to get into. It's a marvel at the mind of God and how great he is and all that he uh, does. So let me just end by saying and asking the question I had at the beginning, what is man? Man is a living being that is superior to all animals because God has put a spirit in his mind. <clears throat>